thing, am I on? We good? Am we on? All right. <clears throat> I'm a nervous wanderer, and when I'm talking, I don't stand still very well, so I made Tyler figure out how to make this work. So it also forces you to aim better when you're throwing stuff, So, because I don't stand still very well. Um, if I start babbling or wandering, Miriam's already instructed Colin to hit the button so that moves the slides along. Otherwise, I've got control of it. Um, I did volunteer for this. I wasn't bribed, nor was I coerced, although Tyler did tell me he'd pay me exactly the same amount they pay me for Awana. So <clears throat> we're good to go <clears throat> on that. Um, I'm not a preacher. I'm from a family of teachers. So I teach. So if I ask a question and it doesn't sound rhetorical, it's probably not. It's okay to talk in church. Okay. So if I'm looking at you for an answer, somebody yell something. It doesn't even matter if it pertains to the message. Just yell something. It'll work. It'll keep me moving. Okay. Um, the last song was one that I requested. Um, and my goal today is to use that song and also a lot of other stuff to change our perspectives on how we think about a few things. Um, so I'm going to pray real quick first, and then I'll kind of talk through where we're heading for today. Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you for allowing us the freedoms that we have in this country to gather together and to worship you. I pray that you would uh, open my mouth for the words that you would have me to speak and open all of our hearts to learn more about you today. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, my goal today is I'm going to use uh, Bible, science, and history, and I'm going to throw them all together and hopefully come up with a message that makes sense, and at the end of it, um, I'll give you a challenge or, or something to take forward out into the world. Now, for those of you who have been with me in Sunday school, the history part will be the, the brief part because I don't know that, so if you need more of the history part, talk to Bob. Okay, the science part I could stay on for a long time. So that might be where we need to move the slides along a little bit. So we're going to talk about the light, which if you'll notice on the slide, it's capital the light and lowercase the lighthouses. Okay, the lighthouses is lowercase on purpose. And that's where we're going with this as we go. Um, Speaking of lights and lighthouses, um, I'm the same as anybody else who speaks up there. You find things online that you just have to share. So I found a cool story about a lighthouse. It's been going around the internet for a little while. So if you've heard it, just bear with me. If you haven't heard it, um, just listen. But this is a, um, a transcript from a radio conversation um, that was going on. And uh, there was a uh, ship that was out in the ocean and as it was going, it saw another light coming straight at it. And so the ship had, uh, had called out and said, please divert your course 15 degrees to the south to avoid a collision. And the other light came back and said, please, I recommend you divert your course 15 degrees to the north so that we can avoid a collision. The boat came back and said, that's a negative. You will divert your course 15 degrees to the south and avoid a collision. The other one came back and said, that's a negative. I'm the captain of a U.S. naval ship, and I say again, you will divert your course. The one came back and said, no, you will divert your course. I'm a seaman second class. For any of you who know that, that's the low guy on the totem pole, and the other guy was the high guy on the totem pole, okay? <clears throat> So the one boat comes back and says, you don't understand. This is the aircraft carrier USS Lincoln, one of the largest ships in the American fleet. We have three destroyers and three cruisers with us. You will divert your course or we will be forced to take countermeasures. <clears throat> the reply came back, this is a lighthouse. It's your call. <clears throat> So we're going to talk about lights and lighthouses today. <clears throat> Jesus, I think all of us can say, is mentioned many times in the Bible as the light. Jesus is the light. We're going to go through numerous times where it's mentioned that Jesus is the light. What I did find 
even though there's really cool songs about it, and I like all the songs, so don't get me wrong, I'm not putting down songs by the end of this message, but there's a lot of cool songs that talks about Lighthouse, but there's never a mention of Lighthouse in the Bible. I've looked, I've looked lots of times. There's not a single mention of the word Lighthouse. There's allusions to a Lighthouse. There's things that might sound like it's talking about a Lighthouse. And so for some reason one day, I was trying to figure out why. So were there not lighthouses in Bible times? Did Jesus not know about lighthouse? Obviously God knows what a lighthouse is. Okay? And then I thought, well, is there a difference between being a light and being a lighthouse? And why am I worried about this? And through that is what you get from me today, is what God showed me and kind of laid on my heart on a light versus a lighthouse. Um, again, lighthouse, the word, unless somebody can find it for me, is never in the Bible. Light is in it more times than I wanted to count. <laughs> it's a lot. We're going to go through a few of them, um, and by the end of this, hopefully I can make sense out of why I was thinking this through. Jesus is the light of the world. Genesis 1.3 says, And then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. <clears throat> this took me a long time in studying the Bible and in my Christian faith and actually sitting down to study the Bible to realize what this verse actually meant. Because Genesis 1.3 is, does anybody remember which day on creation we're on? Day one, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. And it took me a long time of reading to make this make sense in my head because God doesn't create the sun and the moon and the stars until day four. But on day one, He said, let there be light. Where did the light come from? This is the first time where we see God is light. Jesus is light. He was literally the light of the world. There was nothing else to make light at this time in creation. Sun, moon, and stars is day four. I looked it up twice this morning to make sure I didn't screw it up. Okay? <clears throat> and the stars, if you'd care to study that, our Hubble telescope sits out in space, I don't know how far, and it still hasn't seen the end of the stars that God made. So this light that we're talking about is the light of the world is God and Jesus being God. In Psalms 119.105, it says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. For those of you who are in Awana, this is part of the pledge to the Bible that we use every week in Awana. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I hide your words in my heart that I might not sin against you as the rest of the pledge. But your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. It lights the path. Your word. Jesus is that word. Jesus is that light. Jesus is the light of the world in these two verses. In Psalms, this is a Psalm of David talking about as he looks to go into battle, as he looks to do things that your word is a lamp to my feet and a light unto my path. He didn't have all of God's word like we do. <clears throat> Psalms 27 said, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Sorry, this is David's Psalm. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? This is David talking as he's looking to go into battle. As David is, is uh, the king, David. This is a psalm and it says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. <clears throat> Whom shall I fear? So all the way back throughout the Old Testament, into Old Testament times, clear back to the beginning of time, God has shown and talked about being the light of the world. Jesus is the light of the world. These are, in Old Testament times, allusions to Jesus. Okay, So as we start looking at 
the light of the world, we can look into New Testament times. And it follows through. So all the way from the first day of creation when God and Jesus was the actual light of the world. And then Jesus again spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. He is the light of the world. He is the light of life. <clears throat> Jesus spoke to them. They may know who them is in John 8. You may know who the them is. He's talking to his disciples and he's talking to the Pharisees. The timing of this verse is right after an incident where Jesus bent down and wrote something in the sand. And sometime after that, I don't know the timing in between, timing in between, it doesn't say. But Jesus spoke to them and He said, I am the light of the world. He who follows Me will not walk in the darkness, but He will have the light of life. Jesus repeats it. He is the light. He is the light of the world. He is the light of life. He is that light that people are looking for. And that light in John 1.5 says, shines into the darkness, but what? The darkness does not comprehend it. I did this in Awana one time. Don't do this with kids. Don't do it at home. It freaked everybody out. We had a lot of, it was bad. <clears throat> but I tried to prove how dark a cave was when Daniel was in with the lions. And so we were in the room beside the chapel downstairs and I shut the door and turned the lights off. Don't do that with kids. <clears throat> it did not go very well. But <laughs> all I would have needed was one light to pierce that darkness. If I would have had one flashlight and turned it on, I could have calmed everybody. I didn't. That was a mistake. <clears throat> okay. The light shines into the darkness, but the darkness doesn't comprehend it. It flees from it. The darkness doesn't want anything to do with that light. It's the same in our world today. Shine the light on what some people are doing. They flee from it. When your parents said nothing good happens after 10 o'clock at night, it's because it's dark. Nothing good happens after 10 o'clock at night, right? <clears throat> and in 1 John 1, 5 and 7, I skipped it over here. <clears throat> this is the message we have heard from Him. And we announce to you that God is is light and in him there is no darkness if we walk in the light and he himself is the light we have fellowship with one another and the blood of jesus his son in first john he tells us once again emphatically god is light if we walk in the light we don't have to worry about the darkness where there's no darkness in him at all so we have to walk in that light so, through His Word, <clears throat> we can see from the beginning of time, Jesus has set Himself up as the light of the world. He's the light of the world. He's the light of life. He's our light that's inside of us. Okay, The Holy Spirit in us is a light. So I think we can all agree that Jesus is the light of the world. We're all in agreement of that from His Word. As I tell my nod your head so I can hear you thinking. <clears throat> okay. So, from him being the light of the world, who or what are lighthouses? Where does that come from? Who or what are the lighthouses? What are lighthouses for? Why is it not just the light? Lighthouses are there to warn mariners seafaring people of the dangerous shallows. They're there to warn people about perilous coasts. And they're there to help guide the vessel safely into the harbor. Lighthouses are warnings and lighthouses are guides. They do both. They do all of the above. So then I had to think, why don't they mention lighthouses in the Bible? Were there not lighthouses in biblical times? Where did lighthouse, when did lighthouses start? 
because that's where my brain went. Like, why aren't we talking about them? We aren't talking about, is this thing on? Am I echoing? I feel like I'm echoing. Okay. <clears throat> Lighthouses are mentioned as far back as 1200 B.C. <clears throat> the Iliad, I believe, is where that one comes from. Lighthouses are mentioned 1200 B.C. Okay, so 1200 years prior to Christ. There's a lighthouse called the Pharos of Alexandria. The Pharos of Alexandria is one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It was built in 280 B.C. So if you think about even in New Testament times, with all the travels that Paul would have had, with all the places that any of these writers or disciples would have had, the Pharos in Alexandria would have been known. It's, it's one of the wonders of the world. Everybody would have known about the Pharos, the lighthouse in Alexandria. <clears throat> it was 350 feet tall. Give or take, it was probably about the size of, if I'm sizing it up pretty close, it'd be a little bit taller than one of the elevators here in town. <clears throat> so about 350, no, it wouldn't be way taller than that. Elevator's probably 50 feet tall, so stack that elevator on top of itself about six times, okay? <clears throat> it was about 350 feet tall, so everybody knew about the lighthouse in Alexandria. <clears throat> Lighthouses weren't uncommon in biblical times. Lighthouses started as bonfires on the beach. There's the beach. Don't run your boat into it, right? Or you know where it's at. Partially because the boats that they were using back then didn't have huge engines on them and they weren't running at 30 knots an hour, you know. They had a, a pace coming in, a speed coming in. They were slowing down. They knew they were coming into the shallows, okay? Started as bonfires on the beach. And then as the waters were different, it elevated. And then it could be seen from longer distances. So if you think about in 280 B.C., there wasn't an electric light 350 feet up on the Pharos of Alexandria. Okay? Somebody had to keep that thing lit. I don't want to be that guy. Okay? Because somebody had to make sure... That was lit every night and stayed lit throughout darkness so that everybody could see coming into that harbor. If people don't see coming into the harbor, they don't see the dangers. They don't see what's going on. They can't make it to safety. Somebody has to tend the lighthouse because it's usually either wood or coal at that time. So it had to keep being replenished. <clears throat> this Now we get to talk science for a little while, okay? In 1822, and this is kind of where my study started was around in this age because I wanted to figure out lighthouses because I'd heard something really cool about lighthouses. And it was because of this guy. In 1822, a French physicist named Fresnel created a lens. So in order for a lighthouse light to be seen from here to over there, there had to be something to project that light, okay, through the darkness so that you didn't just see it when you got there, okay? So prior to 1822, you used a double convex lens. How many of you have glasses, okay? So you either got a concave or a convex lens in your glasses, Okay, but if you have a convex lens in your glass, it curves out. So they used a double convex lens. And then the light that was coming in got refracted. It hit something and then it went out. The problem was to get a double convex lens the size that you would need to project light out of a lighthouse. It was made of solid glass and it was far too thick and far too heavy to get up to the top of a lighthouse. The lens would be about this high and about this thick of solid glass, okay? And they just couldn't make that work. So up until this time in 1822, everybody just looked at a light on top of a lighthouse. In 1822, this Fresnel <clears throat> came up with his lens, and his lens allows a small light from a lighthouse to be seen at least 30 miles away. So that lighthouse can now be seen not from five miles, but the ships are starting to move faster now. And now you have 30 miles that this light can be cast because of this lens. 
So we're going to stay on this picture so you guys all understand the physics behind this. <clears throat> so when you do, just raise your hand and then I'll know we can move on, right? <clears throat> the top one is that double convex lens, like I said. But to get a double convex lens to work, it has to be massively huge. And what you're looking for is to try and get all the points of light to meet together at one spot so that it shoots out as one big beam of light. What Fresnel did was use Snell's Law. We all know that one, right? Snell's Law is the incidence and of angle of incidence and the angle of refraction of light through a medium. So he used Snell's Law, and in this lens, he put a ton of different angles of glass all over the place. So that every time the light hit one of those pieces of glass, it refracted to the same place. So now he can use a much smaller lens using glass angles and he can now bend that light and he can put it all in one spot with a much smaller lens that is e more easily capable of being taken with you. They now make Fresnel lenses that you can use for camping to start your fire with by using sunlight and it's a flat sheet that's about this big and you can hold it, and it will pinpoint the light right where you want to start your fire, and you can start a fire like that. <clears throat> this all comes from this physicist from 1822. This is where the lighthouse has really started being able to be a lighthouse, to shine that light out, to let people see it from a long distance. So those ships that are moving faster now with the boats can now see it from a long distance. Now, the science of it makes sense to me because I've been through a lot of science class. If it doesn't make sense to you, I got a cooler picture that shows you what a Fresnel lens does. So this is what a Fresnel lens does. And if you know where that is from, you're a nerd like me. <clears throat> Anybody know where that's from? Somebody, please. That would be the Death Star from Star Wars. <clears throat> which is a large Fresnel lens. You can see all the light came together. It was put together. It was made into one huge beam of light, and it was shot out. Now, in the Death Star, it destroyed a planet. Okay, In the lighthouse, we're using it for good. Okay, This is the good and evil part of it. But if you don't understand... Uh, i got to get back to it. If you don't understand that picture of a Fresnel lens then that picture might help you because now we're seeing that light come together. We're sending a beam of light out into the world. And so this is what brought me to this. If Jesus is the light, who's supposed to be that lighthouse? I can tell you from studying the Bible, there's a really cool thing that God does because God can be the light and can do all this. God can do whatever He wants. Please remember that. And contrary to our belief as Christians or the Jews' belief in the Old Testament, God doesn't actually need us. He just allows us to be on His team. We get a choice to be on His team and play the game with Him. He could do all this stuff by Himself, but He lets us be on the team and join Him. <clears throat> who or what is a lighthouse? A lighthouse has to be able to shine a light into the darkness. A lighthouse has to be able to warn people of the impending perils of things that are coming on. This is what we talked about a lighthouse is. It has to warn of perils that are coming in. A lighthouse doesn't make choices. A lighthouse gives you options. Just like that ship in the sea that wanted to argue, you change your course, no, you change your course, no, you're changed. Well, it's your call, buddy. I'm a lighthouse. You make whatever choice you want. Lighthouses always have the same thing. They can't make a choice for a boat, but they can tell them what the right choices are. <clears throat> and a lighthouse, one of its main jobs, it's to guide people to safety. It's to guide those ships into the safe harbor. It's to make it safe. <clears throat> so what God laid on my heart, Bob had it already. Some of you didn't hear him because he's facing me. <clears throat> okay. 
I think we, as believers, are supposed to be lighthouses. We have the light inside of us. Jesus is the light of the world. Our job is to be lighthouses. As a person, as a church, as a people in general, I believe, and what God laid on my heart is, while Jesus is the light of the world, He lets us be the lighthouse. We don't have to turn the light on. We don't have to stick the lens in front of the light. When you stick a Fresnel lens in front of the light, it's going to make a beam. It just does. That's how it works. <clears throat> it's our job as lighthouses to shine the light into the darkness. <clears throat> it's our job to warn about perils and troubles and things that are coming. Okay, That's part of our job. The Bible gives us that that part of the job. It's our job to warn of these things. It's our job to give people options and choices. It is not our job to make choices for them. That would be easier if I could just, everybody that I loved, if I could just say, you're saved now. But that's their choice that they have to make to be on the team, to be part of the lighthouse. <clears throat> it's our job to lead people to safety. We are the lighthouses as a people and as a church. In Matthew 5, it says, You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anybody hide, light a lamp and put it under a basket, but you put it on a lampstand and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. We're supposed to be the light that is set on a hill. That sounds like a lighthouse. You set your light on a hill so that everybody can see it. We're supposed to shine the light forth to those who are around us. There's a lot of ways to do that. But first of all, we have to have the light. We get the light when you're saved, but how do we make the light brighter? We read our Bible. We go to church. We hang out with fellow believers. We go to Sunday school. We go to Bible study. We keep making that light brighter so that when it comes through the lens, it's brighter. So I have a question for you, because this one hit me. And I realize that somewhere in all of our lives, there was a lighthouse. There's somebody that all of you can think of right now that was your lighthouse. That shined God's light towards you and warned you and guided you into the safe harbor. Was it a prayer warrior at church? Was it mom? Was it dad? Was it grandma sitting at the table every day praying for the grandkids? Who was it in your life? And I want you to think about that because we all have a lighthouse. Somewhere for us to get that light to shine to us, somebody allowed it to shine through them. Think about who your lighthouse is or was. Who showed it to you? Because we all had it. There was somebody or there was a group that wouldn't give up on shining their light. And sooner or later when it swept around the circle as a lighthouse, it hit you. And it lit a light inside of you. And so in our answer, how are we doing as lighthouses? As a church, this is a picture that came to my brain. I have a weird brain, but no comments on that. Okay? How far do we shine as a church? How far is that beacon shining as a lighthouse on a church? I had a really cool picture in my head, and I thought of this beacon on the top of First Baptist 
shining to the southwest, to a small town in Nebraska. <clears throat> and then there's another lighthouse in Nebraska that just picked up that light, and TD just went to another campus with that light. And our light shines clear down to El Simbrador. And that light gets picked up. And the more lights they have shining towards them, the brighter that light gets to shine out. And we get to be a part of that light as a church. But to bring it back here, how far down Grand Avenue are we shining as a light? Do we make it to the bridge? Now, the more I think about this, churches have church bells to call people in, right? <clears throat> Jesus said, come to me, but Jesus never told the church to sit here and have them come here. Jesus told the church to go out there. Jesus told the church to shine our light out there so that they can see the light so they want to come in safely. <clears throat> so how far are we shining as a church in our community? How far are we lighting things up as a community? And individually, how are we doing? When you go home, does the light go underneath the bushel basket? Or does it shine to those around you? When you go home, when you go to work, when you're talking to your neighbors, can they see the light? Are you being a lighthouse or did you shut it off? Are you being a lighthouse or are you just holding the light inside? Meaning you move that lens out of the way so nobody can see it projecting out. You just hold it in. Our job is to be a lighthouse. I strongly believe Jesus is the light of the world and He gives us the opportunity to have the light in us and our job is to turn the lighthouse on and shine it out. We have to work on the light we have to read we have to study we have to do things so the light is bright and then we have to shine it out in our to into our community to wherever it may be able to go so my challenge to you is how are we as lighthouses do we have the fresnel lens in place so that we're sending light out or do we have the lens in a closet somewhere so we're holding the light in and it's not very bright? It's there if you get close enough, you know. But if you're not very close, you're probably not going to see it. My challenge is live as a lighthouse. Shine that light into everywhere that you go to touch so that everybody can see and hear and know who the true light of the world is because they heard it from you. And from that, I'll pray, and then we'll wrap her up from there. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, thank you for today. I thank you for letting us be a part of your team. I thank you for being the light of the world. And I pray that you would help each and every one of us as we go forward, that we can be lighthouses, that we can shine your light into a dark world, Lord. I thank you for all of this, and I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.